The next item of business is topical questions, and in order to get as many members in as possible, it would be helpful to have short and succinct questions and answers to match. I call question number one, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that decisions about the procurement of vessels 801 and 802 were rushed for political purposes. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Well, Presiding Officer, it is entirely wrong to suggest the contract award was rushed for political reasons. Firstly, the timetable does not support that notion, given that Ferguson's was publicly announced as the preferred bidder in August. Secondly, the contract was awarded in line with all of the procurement rules and practices in the normal way, as the Audit Scotland report confirms. And thirdly, Presiding Officer, contrary to what Jim McCall said this morning on the BBC, it was the Chief Executive of CMAL and Jim McCall himself who signed the contract. This is a man with a clear interest in shifting the blame on others when the root cause ultimately to the delays of these important vessels was the construction under FMEL. New Bibby. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Yesterday, the First Minister said she had no hesitation in answering any and all questions. President officer, I believe this Parliament must hear from the First Minister in detail this week. But in the First Minister's absence, is Kate Forbes able to confirm whether the award of this contract, without a full refund guarantee, was discussed and agreed by the Cabinet? If so, were they made aware of CMAL's concerns? Or if not, is the Scottish Government's position the decision to ignore CMAL was made by Derek Mackay and Derek Mackay alone? Presiding officer, there has been a debate on this subject. There has been a statement on this subject. I am answering questions on this subject and I have answered uh, press queries on this subject. So in terms of scrutiny, I think uh, the member will find that there has been significant uh, scrutiny. In terms of the procurement process, as I said in my first answer, the procurement process was undertaken in good faith, following appropriate due diligence. There were no concerns raised at the point of announcing the preferred bidder in August 2015, and that is why the preferred bidder was announced, based on the advice of CMAL, FMEL clearly scoring the highest score overall. When concerns were raised, mitigations were put in place. That is all very well documented in the Audit Scotland report. Neil Bibby. President Officer, that didn't answer the question that I asked. Well, it failed to answer the question I asked. And I think it's evident that only the First Minister can clear up the questions about what has went wrong here and who was involved when. We need honesty and openness about this. We cannot afford secrecy and cover-up because taxpayers, in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis, are paying for the costs of this government's failure. Audit Scotland have pointed to a lack of information about the decision-making process. This is very serious indeed. In order for the Audit Committee to do the job it must now do, every piece of relevant information now needs to be published, including communications between ministers, special advisers, accountable officers and government agencies regarding the award of this contract. Can Kate Forbes at least confirm today that this will happen? President Officer, Kate Forbes has said today there was no rush and no politics. I don't think anyone thinks that's credible. Well, I can go further than that. It's already happened. There are reams of paperwork that has been published, publicly available on the Scottish Government website. And the fact is that the evidence about the lack of a full refund guarantee has been in the public domain since 2019. But it has taken Neil Bibby three years to come across that fact. So if the member, if the member is serious about learning the lessons, if he's serious about analysis and facts, then I would suggest he goes back to the parliamentary inquiry, as well as the Audit Scotland report, to look at the facts. In terms of uh, the First Minister, the First Minister stood here last week taking full responsibility for the decisions. We abide by collective responsibility. We've been open. We've been honest. We recognise where things have gone wrong. We are learning the lessons for the future. And if the member would like to look at the facts, it's all publicly available. 
There are a number of members seeking to ask a supplementary. I'll try to take as many as possible. But could I just suggest that if I am to do so, it would perhaps be courteous if questions could be asked and then answers listened to. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presenting Officer. As the Audit Scotland report highlighted, the yard was being placed into liquidation, and the only option was for the Scottish Government to step in and save it. And no opposition MSP has yet indicated whether they would have stepped in or let the yard go into liquidation, thus losing the jobs, shutting the yard, and the vessels would have been finished elsewhere. However, I think we must all agree on the importance of these vessels and that they must be in service as soon as possible, so it is vital that the Parliament remains abreast of progress at the yard. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further detail regarding how Parliament will continue to be updated going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Parliament will continue to be updated. The Chief Executive of uh, Ferguson Marine provides the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee with a quarterly update and writes to inform the committee if additional issues arise. The system works well, as proven by the most recent uh, updates around the legacy cable issues. I am also in discussion with the Chair and Chief Executive on an almost fortnightly basis about what further performance information should be made uh, public on a more regular basis. Ultimately, I agree with Stuart McMillan. We need to make progress on these vessels. We need to learn the lesson. But the, the bottom line is, if we were to pull the plug, then it throws the vessels into jeopardy as well as the yard. Supplementary, Graeme Simpson. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim McCall will be surprised to hear that he's been accused of shifting the blame today. We need some straight answers to straight questions here. Was it Keith Brown who approved the contracts for the ferries? Why was the advice from CMAL not to go ahead ignored? And given that Jim McCall has said today that he would not have proceeded had he known of those concerns, should you not have told him? Well, on the contrary to public statements that were made this morning, FMEL were crystal clear about the concerns that were raised about their inability to provide the required full refund guarantee. If you read the Audit Scotland report, and I go back to the point that we like facts in this debate, the Audit Scotland report refers to the fact that when the, announced, the announcement was made about the preferred bidder in the August, no concerns were raised. A number of weeks later, concerns were flagged about the required refund guarantee. At that point, FMEL would have been fully involved in the discussions around uh, the mitigations that were required because there was not a full refund guarantee in place. Audit Scotland have covered in detail the mitigations that were pursued as a result, including around the schedule of payments. So at the point of the announcement in August, there were no concerns it raised that was signed off, and ultimately, CMAL and Mr McCall signed off on the contract. Supplementary, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Is there a ministerial direction on the agreement of this ferry contract? Cabinet Secretary. CMAL and Mr McCall, on behalf of FMEL, signed the contract. Supplementary Willie Rennie, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The First Minister has repeatedly claimed that Audit Scotland found nothing untoward in the procurement of the contract. But that is not true, is it? Audit Scotland said the failure in the procurement process to provide a full refund guarantee and a lack of milestones when the international standard was not followed. So the First Minister is just wrong. The procurement process was flawed and this led to the loss of millions of pounds and a five-year delay. Will the Finance Secretary put the record straight and agree to a public inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I will go further right now and actually just quote the Audit Scotland report. And the quote states that CMAL's, uh, the high level review into CMAL's procurement procedure found no material issues with the procurement. As I've set out already in terms of the timetable, when the preferred bidder was announced in the August, concerns had not been flagged. A number of weeks later, when concerns were flagged about the full refund guarantee, there were discussions about mitigations put in place. The procurement process is independent of ministerial intervention. That is a well-known and well-established fact. 
when it comes to procurement processes. And as the member has said, it followed an internationally recognised standard. Supplementary, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Can I ask, given that the yard is owned by the Scottish public, how many non CMAL orders for shipbuilding is the yard, the yard currently actively engaged in, bidding for, or likely to secure? And if it becomes obvious that the future of the yard and its workforce is best served by returning it to the commercial sector, as the government wants to do with Presswick Airport, is that something the government would be willing to do? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, me the, the member is right to flag this point because obviously, whilst concern and focus right now is on uh, securing these two vessels. Obviously, since the yard was nationalised, it's completed three other vessels. So uh, the yard is uh, progressing with work. And I say that point because I do think that morale at the yard amongst the workers uh, needs to be protected as far as possible, considering these public debates. Uh, in terms of uh, the yard pursuing other work opportunities, it is actively engaged in a number of commercial opportunities. Um, obviously, these need to, to progress. And obviously, timetabling is key here because it's at the point at which uh, the two 801 and 802 are completed that it would be looking to, to pursue other work opportunities. Supplementary, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. If the contract had not been awarded at the time, it's highly likely that the shipyard would not have survived. And I agree with the STUC's Ros Fryer that the Scottish Government was 100% correct to intervene. But she was also clear we must not let the current issues of distract from the need to build capacity in future orders. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government will work with the Yard to improve its competitiveness and win new contracts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I welcome the, the Member's support for, for the Yard and, and echo those uh, sentiments. Um, I have set out priorities for the Yard's management to finish building the two ferries currently under construction and also to get the Yard into shape to compete for, for new work. The best way to secure the Yard's future order book is to make the Yard as efficient, as competitive as possible and to win contracts on uh, merit and we engage uh, regularly with the new chief executive uh, and as shareholder continue to support the yard in achieving their goals in any way we can that is what audit scotland recommended in their report to focus on completing the vessels and turning the yard around uh, question number two alex go hamilton thank you very much deputy presiding officer to ask the scottish government what urgent action it will undertake to resolve waiting time delays in a and e following recent reported estimates from the royal college of emergency medicine that the delays had contributed to 240 avoid avoidable deaths this year cabinet secretary hamza yusuf these are our sobering statistics uh, we have always recognized the relationship between long waits in a and e and increased harm uh, of which uh, we remain, of course, committed to delivering improved A&E performance. However, there's simply no doubt whatsoever the pressures of the pandemic are clearly impacting uh, on said performance. We have a range of actions underway to help reduce pressure in A&E and maximise capacity, including our record uh, £300 million of new investment to help the service deal with system pressures over the winter, our £1 billion NHS recovery plan, which aims to drive the recovery of the NHS. The key to reducing these long waits is to improve flow by reducing occupancy levels. We are delivering this capacity through a range of actions, including our enhanced hospital at home service uh, and, avoiding, uh, and by avoiding admissions and shortening the length of stay. Now, ultimately, the single most important factor in easing A&E pressure is controlling COVID transmission. Finally, uh, we will continue to work collaboratively with the RCEM to understand how we can improve long delays in patient care. Alex go Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that reply, but I'm afraid it's just not good enough, Deputy Presiding Officer. We learned today that waiting times are the very worst on record. Official statistics for the week ending March 20th shows 2,615 patients waited more than eight hours to be seen, and over 1,000 waited more than 12. Under this government, this crisis has rumbled on for years. This is not just about COVID, with no respite for staff and no redress for patients. And, presiding officer, we continue to see the mishandling of this crisis by ministers plumb new depths. It is clear for all to see that they have simply lost control of the situation. My party has long been calling for an inquiry into avoidable deaths caused by waits in emergency care. So does the Cabinet uh, Secretary agree with me that we now need one urgently? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, what I would say to, to Alex Cole Hamilton is that he makes a passing, almost a fleeting reference to the pandemic. But I don't think anybody can suggest that it is anything other than the pressures of the pandemic uh, that are causing the significant drop 
in a &E performance that we have seen. I mean, they are just not compatible to the figures that we had pre-pandemic. And that is true of the current figures we have. We are seeing the highest level of infection, record numbers in our hospitals with COVID. Uh, and, and on top of that, uh, huge numbers of staff absences because of those that are, are testing uh, positive due to COVID. In fact, they've doubled over the last four weeks. So the, these accumulative pressures uh, are undoubtedly causing that dip in a and &E performance. So we'll take action where we can. Today, of course, the Scottish Ambulance Service has announced a record recruitment in a single year, 540 new recruits uh, in a single year, which is positive. So we'll continue to invest. In terms of his questions, he knows that there is a public inquiry uh, in relation to COVID, and it will be up to the chair of that inquiry uh, to look at whatever issues she sees fit uh, in this regard. Alex Go Hamilton. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is quite astonishing. One of the first questions I ever asked in this chamber of his predecessor was about exactly this, ambulance waiting times. And for the, first, for the Cabinet Secretary to just dismiss this as being an aberration caused by COVID does a disservice to staff and to patients. Presiding Officer, 15 years of SNP mismanagement of our healthcare system, and we have reached a new low. So many staff are at breaking point, suffering from severe burnout and even trauma in some cases. Just a few months ago, an FOI submitted by the Scottish Liberal Democrats revealed that staff absences within the Scottish Ambulance Service alone shot up by 300 per cent. Due to workforce planning and a lack of vision and relief from the SNP, some are even considering leaving the workforce altogether. This SNP Green Government voted down my could, party's staff... Could we have staff, a question, please, Mr Hamilton? Question. Time is moving on. They voted down our party's call for a staff burnout prevention strategy and dismissed calls Mr. for... Mr Hamilton, I really a want a question assembly. now. Time is moving on to the detriment of other members who also want a shot. Thank you. All the while, this crisis worsens. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is he waiting for? Nobody is waiting. That is why we have invested £300 million uh, in our NHS to cope with those winter pressures. It's why we have invested in the recruitment of 1,000 healthcare support workers. It's why we have invested additional monies in the Scottish Ambulance Service, who now have recruited record numbers over the last financial year. So nobody is waiting around. And what I would say finally to ask Cole Hamilton is where there are good ideas from members of the opposition, I promise them that I will engage with them. Instead of, instead of a burnout strategy, instead of a bit of paper uh, lying on the shelf, we are investing 12 million in staff wellbeing. So we are taking action. In terms of 15 years of the SNP, can I remind Alex Cole Hamilton for the fourth time, of course, the people of Scotland have voted for my party uh, to ensure that we have stewardship over the NHS while he languishes in the opposition. Supplementary, uh, Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Behind these truly shocking statistics are real people. People like those waiting at the RAH in Paisley, in my region, which the Cabinet Secretary visited a few weeks ago. Did the Cabinet Secretary listen on that visit to what staff told him about the pressures they are facing? Did he bother to talk to patients in Paisley who could have told him about waiting for hours, often in pain, in the back of an ambulance? And did he listen to Dr John Thompson, Vice President of the RCEM in Scotland, who said, and I quote, the rhetoric of it's bad, but we're not as bad as elsewhere, is no longer applicable. So when will the Cabinet Secretary except that people across the country are fed up of excuses. Indeed, pre-pandemic a &E targets have not been met for two years. And when will we accept that people want an NHS that works, not one where over 1,000 patients are waiting 12 hours to be seen in A&E? Cabinet Secretary. To say in all the questions that you asked, yes, I met with uh, uh, staff at the RAH. Of course, I've spoken to patients up and down uh, the country. I'm somebody who uses the health service and my family uses the health service uh, ourselves. And I should say I'm grateful to every single member of our NHS and social care for the incredible heroic efforts they've shown over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and what I would say to, to Paul O'Kane, nobody is suggesting, neither me, I know when the First Minister has stood at uh, First Minister's questions, nobody has denied the fact that there were issues and challenges pre-pandemic. But I would hope, I would hope that Paul O'Kane would recognise the reason for the scale of the challenge, the reason that we're seeing this level of pressure is because of the pressures of the pandemic. You cannot have record levels of infection, record levels of hospital occupancy with COVID, high numbers of staff absence due to COVID, and think that that is not having a severe impact. These last two years have frankly been the most difficult uh, of the NHS's uh, almost 74 year existence. And we will continue to invest in the health service and, and, and of course, our record investment of £18 billion uh, pounds, uh, is well known. And I will continue to engage with the RCM on his final point uh, with Dr John Thompson, as I have done uh, during the course of my time as Health Secretary. Supplementary, Sue Weber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, we've heard that new statistics this week revealed the worst A&E waiting times on record. Almost two in five not seen within four hours, 
while shamefully over a thousand people spent more than 12 hours in a &E department. It is tragic but abundantly clear that hundreds more people will die in a &E if the SNP government do not wake up and smell the coffee. Have the families of those who have died in preventable circumstances been informed of the reason their loved one has died? And what urgent action is the SNP government taking to curb and eliminate all and every unavoidable death in our NHS? Avoidable death. Uh, of course, uh, whenever any patient uh, passes away, there is uh, detailed notes uh, that are passed on to family next of kin of uh, why that individual uh, has sadly uh, passed on. Uh, of course, uh, where, where there are, uh, where, where that uh, can, for example, I know there have been cases that have been raised where communication could have been better on that front, then I expect health boards, of course, to ensure there is appropriate uh, uh, communication in that respect. What I would say um, to, to Sue Weber once again is that I understand, of course, the, the, the job, important job of opposition to scrutinise and ask questions uh, on this front, and I'm happy to continue to keep answering uh, those questions. What I would say is that there are no easy solutions, no easy answers to this. The single biggest thing we can do is control COVID transmission. That is the single biggest thing to help us to ease some of the A&E pressures we're facing. And if I had listened to the Conservatives about lifting of regulations and lifting of protective measures, then actually I think the situation would be far worse than it is at the moment. And supplementary, Julian Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This un unprecedented pressure will have undoubtedly added a further burden to an already tired workforce, both in A&E and in GP out of hours. Reports of deaths due to a &E waits will have been really hard reading for staff who have been under pressure for quite some time. Given this further pressure, what further me measures can the Scottish Government take to support this vital workforce? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think ensuring that our, our staff are, are well treated and well taken care of, both in terms of their mental well-being, and I've referenced some of the investment we've made in that regard, ensuring that, ensuring that they are well paid, and they are, of course, the best paid in the entire UK, and ensuring that we are growing that workforce as per our national uh, workforce strategy that was recently launched means that, of course, as we recover, and we will, of course, recover, uh, then, uh, then expanding that workforce will be uh, uh, vital to that recovery effort. And what I will say uh, is the conversations that we are having and have been having for many months now with the health, with, with health boards up and down the country is that we, do, we know that this will not be the last wave of COVID that we will experience, unfortunately. And therefore, it's really vital for us to do our best uh, to try to insulate both unscheduled care and also planned care from future shocks. And we hope to be announcing some changes uh, to IPC guidance uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the very near future. Thank you. And that concludes topical questions. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll allow a very short pause in order for front bench teams to move if they wish. <laughs>